For our last video in this unit, we need to talk about bond polarity and the forces holding everything together, which polarity relates to. So let's start off with polarity. So as you already know, electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract an electron in a bond. That is what is creating our bonds we've been talking about. You'll remember from our periodic trends unit that it increases up and increases to the right because it is a 3 o'clock trend. So the word polar means having opposite ends, positive, negative. So if something is nonpolar, that means they share electrons equally. There is not one atom that's being a little bit greedy with those electrons. They share it equally. However, a polar bond, and keep in mind both of these are types of covalent bonds, a polar bond has the electron shared unequally. One of the elements involved in the bond is being a little greedy and keeping those electrons a little more often than it should. This creates a partially positive end, the element that's not getting the electrons as often as it should, and a partially negative end, the element that is getting the electrons more often than it should, the bully one. So why would the electron not be shared equally? Well, different atoms have different electronegativities. So some of them have a better ability to attract electrons than others do. Also, it's a tug of war with the electron, so the more electronegative element is going to win. You can think about it any way you need to, but essentially the one with the electronegative, higher electronegativity gets to be the bully. It gets to take electrons more often than it should. So we can figure out whether a substance is polar or nonpolar based on its electronegativity difference. If the difference is greater than 0.4, it is going to be polar, meaning they're not shared equally. However, if the electronegativity di difference is less than or equal to 0.4, then that means it is a nonpolar bond. Now, if you do research online, you're going to see different places use slightly different numbers. For our purposes, we are going to use 0.4, but if you see it somewhere else, there's a little bit of disagreement on what exactly separates one from the other. So let's do some practice with this. So you're determining if the bond is polar or nonpolar. So if we have carbon and oxygen, carbon is a 0.25 electronegativity, oxygen is a 0.35. So if I take 3.5 minus 2.5, that equals 1, which is greater than 0.4, so that means it's polar. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is a 2.1, and carbon is still 2.5. So 2.5 minus 2.1 is 0.4, which is nonpolar because it is equal to 0.4. We can also do hydrogen and oxygen, where if we subtract 3.5 from 2.1, we get 1.4, which is well over 0.4, giving us definitely polar. That's all there is to it. You take one element, you subtract its electronegativity from the other element, and if it's greater than or equal, if it's greater than 0.4, it is polar. If it's less than or equal to 0.4, nonpolar. Nice and simple. You've got this. So molecules are considered to be polar if they have what is called an overall dipole, which this means a partially positive end and a partially negative end. Di meaning two and pole meaning area, so two different areas, positive, negative. So polar molecules have one or more polar bonds in them. Now a molecule can have polar bonds and be nonpolar. We're not going to get too much into that, but if you continue with science, you will see it happen. This happens essentially when the polar bonds cancel each other out that since they are equal, one cancels the other one. Water is very polar. It is one of the most polar substances on the earth, and it actually explains a lot of why water behaves the way it does.
Now, for those of you who are more my visual learners out there, this is kind of showing you what's happening. So we have hydrogen and we have chlorine. They form a covalent bond where they're going to share those electrons. However, chlorine is more electronegative, electronegative than hydrogen is. So that means that chlorine is going to keep that electrons that they're sharing a little more often than it should, resulting in a partially negative charge. This weird little symbol here is what we use to show a partial negative and a partial positive because the hydrogen isn't getting the electrons as often as it should. So all this time we've been learning about intramolecular forces. These are forces that act within molecules. The prefix intra means inside. And these um, are bonds that hold our molecules together from the inside. So there are technically four types of bonds. We have now learned about all of them. There's metallic, ionic, polar covalent, nonpolar um, covalent. You'll remember a metallic bond is formed between two metals, cations, and this is actually the strongest type of intramolecular force. Ionic bonds, which as you remember, are formed between a metal and a nonmetal, cation and an anion. These are second only to metallic bonds in strength. Meanwhile, both polar covalent and nonpolar covalent are between two nonmetals, but in a polar covalent, it has a partial charge because the electrons aren't shared equally. And in a nonpolar covalent, the electrons are shared equally. Nonpolar covalents are our weakest type of intramolecular force. But there are another type of forces called intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces act between, like an intercom that the front office uses goes from the front office to my classroom. Between locations. They determine the physical properties of a substance, such as their boiling point, melting point, and density. Now, these are much weaker than any of our intramolecular forces that we've learned about. These are not as strong as even a nonpolar covalent bond. They are weaker than any of them. There are three types of intramolecular forces we're going to be learning about, and that is dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces. So as far as a dipole-dipole, dipole-dipole interactions occur when the positively charged part of a molecule, because we have a polar bond happening, interact with the partially charged neighboring mo molecule. So like we showed before, where we have hydrogen and chlorine, where they don't share equally because chlorine is more electronegative, so that hydrogen has a partial positive and the chlorine has a partial negative. That positive and negative from other, from one molecule to another, intermolecule, is attracted to each other. We often see this happening between polar covalently bonded molecules. So if something is polar covalent, chances are you have a dipole-dipole attraction happening. It's just the positive of one end being attracted to the negative of another end creating a weak intermolecular force. Now, hydrogen bonding is actually a very specific type of dipole-dipole, so it's kind of a subtype. And it's one that occurs between a hydrogen atom and only oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So in our previous example, we had chlorine, so hydrogen bonding wasn't happening even though hydrogen was a part of it. It only happens between hydrogen and oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. The hydrogen becomes partially positive, and the other, other element becomes partially negative. So it is working just like the dipole-dipole we previously saw, where this oxygen and water, we talked about how polar water is, has a negative, a partially negative charge, and the hydrogen from another water that has a partially positive charge is attracted to that oxygen, forming a hydrogen bond.
Now our last type of intermolecular force we want to talk about are London dispersion forces. And these exist between all types of molecules, both ionic and covalent. So essentially the more electrons a molecule has, the stronger the London dispersion forces are. So the more electrons they have swirling around in there, the stronger they're going to be attracted to each other. So you can see all of these chlorines, even though they don't have a polarity and don't have a partial, they're just attracted to each other. So in summary, we have dipole-dipole, which is formed between partially um, oppositely charged ions. We have hydrogen bonding, which is formed between hydrogen and oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. This is the strongest intermolecular force. Then we have London dispersion forces, which are just formed temporarily where each one is kind of like, hey, I like you, now I'm moving on. It's temporary and the weakest of our intermolecular forces. Now I mentioned earlier that intermolecular forces can influence physical properties. So our stronger forces, both inter- and intramolecular, are going to have high boiling points, high melting points, and low vapor pressure. That's because since the forces holding them together are so strong, they don't want to break apart by boiling, and they don't want to break apart by melting. They want to stay together. Similarly, weaker forces, both inter- and intramolecular, have low boiling points and low melting points and high vapor pressures because they're not being very tightly held together. So that means they boil more easily. Since they're not being held tightly together, they melt more easily. So uh, you can tell how strong of a forces are holding something together based on its boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure. That is it for our covalent bonds unit. Come to class with any questions.